Welcome Burl Press this Memorial Day weekend. We know that it is hard to tell what time of the day it is, let alone what day of the month it is, but today is Memorial Day weekend. Whatever you are doing, we're so honored that you're beginning your day with us as we worship here as a church. We also want to give a special shout out to our armed forces, especially those who have given their lives the last full measure, as we often say, of devotion to our country. We thank all of them. Also, if you happen to have served in any branch of the armed forces, would you just let our chat room know that you have served in some branch of the armed services, and we want to say thank you to you. Without further ado, though, let's begin our worship service. This is our band beginning our service with an incredible old hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. This is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church, wherever you are, we invite you to stand. Uh, if you're able, if you're comfortable, and sing this hymn loud with us. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Alleluia. we regularly engage in a spiritual practice called confession. And what this means is we simply look back over the last day or the last week for those times when we may not have lived fully the lives that God intends us to live. Often it's in our relationships, our relationship with God or with others, perhaps our relationship to this planet or our material possessions. And it may even be our relationship with ourselves. 
So this morning, I would like to lead us in a time of reflection over the past week. But before we begin, I invite you to close your eyes and take a deep breath. Merciful God, as we come into your presence today, we remember all those times when we may not have been aware of your presence this past week, or times when we may have turned our back on you. Forgive us and remind us that you are always here. And we remember those times when either in our actions or our thoughts, we created tension or conflict or perhaps alienation with another individual. Forgive us and move us towards reconciliation. And we remember those times when we may not have appropriately cared for your earth, for this air we breathe, or for nature. Forgive us and show us how to care for your creation. We remember those times when we may have been anxious about our material possessions, or perhaps even ungenerous towards others. Forgive us and open our hands to others. And we also remember today those times when we may have felt shameful, perhaps in a dark place, or perhaps feeling like there was no hope. Forgive us and heal us. Merciful God, we know that you are always ready to forgive us. And so we remember that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and we offer our thanks to you today. And as we take another communal breath together, we remember those who breathed their last breath this past week. We remember those who are in the hospital struggling to breathe we remember those who are finding it hard to catch their breath. And we remember those with joy who breathed their first breath this past week. We thank you for being our God and for being with us from our first breath until our last. Amen. Hello everyone and welcome to Burl Press. My name is Shai and I am the Interim Kids Director and it's an honor to be with you today. Now I want to tell you a story about what happened to me last week. Last week I started making a task list and tried balancing work, school, and personal life things and as I looked at this list it just seemed daunting to me. I was feeling pretty overwhelmed and in the midst of that I received a text from a good friend. And it said this, it said, hey, Shy, just thinking about you, praying for you, and I hope we can connect soon. And in that moment, I didn't feel alone and it didn't feel so daunting. And so I wanna encourage you to do the same thing that my friend did for me. I wanna encourage you to take out your phone and send a text of encouragement, even a prayer or a text of peace or hope to remind someone that they're not alone in this time. So that's what we're gonna do in these next few moments.
being on staff here, I quickly realized that there was something unique about Burl Press. And that's because your congregation is one of the most generous congregations I have ever been a part of. So you guys are generous with your time. You're willing to serve others at our events. You're generous with your gifts by being willing to serve on our choir team or our worship band. And you're even generous with your finances. And here at Burl Press, we welcome all generosity, whether that's in your time, your gifts, or your finances. And so if you are a Burl Press member and you feel called to give, I wanna give you three ways where you can give. So the first way is texting your amount to 84321. The second way is visiting our website, burlpress.org giving. And the third way that you can give is by mailing us a check. And here we are so appreciative for any of your generosity and we're especially appreciative for Mandy and Brian for their gifts of worship. So right now, let's worship together. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. You are speaking truth to power you are laying down our swords, replanting every vineyard till the bread and wine is poured. Your peace will make us one. I've seen you in our home fires. Mandy and Brian, you are incredible saints and gifts to our church. That song was so meaningful. 
Also, Shai, great to see you. We know that you are doing great stuff with our youth. Thank you so much. I just want to say a quick word about what our musicians and our tech people are doing every week. Most of you know what it's like to perform or to practice a song. It can take three to four hours just to perfect one song. So that's what the band and musicians like Mandy and Brian are doing. And then there's the recording phase, which is Stephen and Dan, which it takes at least an hour to do. And then there's the editing phase, and that is Dan Ciappelloni, and that takes three hours. So I just want to give a shout out to our remarkable team. We want to say hi to you today if you're watching from San Jose, California. And I want to say hi to our special friend at Truesdale. We pray the Holy Spirit is with you, even as we are sensing the presence of the Holy Spirit right here, once again, in the youth lounge. People have asked what is going on at Burl Press, and a lot of great ministry continues, but mostly people are asking, how is the move going for the Baird family? It's going pretty well, but I have to say that this last couple of weeks, I have been spending most of my time, when I'm not here, painting the basement of our new house. Now, not to brag, but I might as well, since I got the camera. Uh, this is my son Ewan in the unfinished basement, and uh, this is what it looked like after I painted that unfinished basement. Now, I know what you're thinking. Graham, don't quit your day job. But I also want you to know, notice those colors. Those are the colors of the youth lounge in our next-gen ministries. That's how much I love you. We have created a house that has the same colors as the church. And I'm too much of a cheapskate to buy new paint. The other thing that's happening is we want to give you an opportunity to share this incredible offering that our team does every week. And so we have, we have put together 100 signs that you can put in your front lawn. Now, over the next couple of months, people will be putting uh, placards of their favorite politicians. But I encourage you to put this sign, and you can pick one up at the church from Sonu and Ankar, pick up this sign that says, Burl Press, join us online at 9 a.m. on Sunday, burlpress.online.church. Put that on your front yard, and your neighbors may have a chance to uh, partake in what we're doing every week. And then finally, if you drive past the church or happen to uh, drive through our parking lot, this next week you will see what one of our own wonderful artists named Julie Engelman has done with the parking lot. We have so many kids and families who don't go to the church who are riding bikes around and just playing in an open space. So Julie has created this sidewalk chalk art throughout the parking lot with six-foot social distancing, of course. Check that out, and thank you so much, Julie Engelman. Well, this is our final week of our series called No Fear, God Near. I don't know if you feel the same way, but this series for me as a person who has worked with this concept of the eight words that God says to us again and again throughout the Bible, do not be afraid, I am your God, do not be afraid for I am with you. It has been so helpful for my heart, I hope it has been for yours. But just to walk through the series that we have walked through together We began way back in the sanctuary, if you remember, on our second week of video worship, and the theme that Sunday was, we all have fear, but most of our fears, 90% of our fears, maybe 99%, tend to be what are called what-if fears. Those are things that we imagine to happen, and they're almost always catastrophized. That means we think the worst possible outcome for the what-ifs that come into our brain. But in truth, where we need to live is the what is, and that is where God is. God is the great I am. The next week, we talked about how this book and the people who occupy it, mostly the Jewish people, have written a textbook about how to survive wilderness experiences. The Israelites who spent 40 years in the wilderness and in exile in Babylon, Persian exile, the Greek All of these times of sheltering in place, this book is helpful there. The week later, we talked about protecting our hearts, that we have this tendency in modern society in this time to protect all of our buildings, to protect our public spaces, but we don't protect our private space of our hearts. And on that week, again, we talked about having a centurion for our heart. 
And the centurion is a fivefold guard. It is joy, gentleness, prayer, thanks, and peace. And that will protect our hearts. The next week, we talked about the word courage. And on this Memorial Day weekend, when we remember those who have fought for our country through the years and had courage, we remember the word courage comes to us from this book. And there we saw Joshua and God saying to this young leader, do not fear. And he says, strong courage, have hazak. And that is the encouraging word. The next week, we talked about the kingdom that Jesus built, that many of us are building buildings and rooms that are tangible, that are made of concrete and stone. But from the moment Jesus was born until the moment he died, and even when he was resurrected and ascended into heaven, Jesus built a different kind of kingdom, the kingdom of now. And that's where God wants us to live in the moment, in the kairos, not the chronos. And then last week, we talked about the vaccine that has just been discovered for not the coronavirus, but for fear. And even though many of us have just discovered it, it was invented over 2,000 years ago, and that was John who told us that the perfect way to cast out fear is perfect love. Only loving one another can give us a sense of peace. As we close today, I want to close with another storm story. We began this series talking about Jesus calming a storm, and in that text, he was inside of the boat. Today, Jesus is going to calm a different kind of storm. But one of the primary ideas I want us to take with us this week is that an essential feature of who God is, is that God is both strong and capable And he is fortified to be able to handle the big problems of the world. And God is also a comforter. God is also a kind God. God is God and God is kind. And so that's our theme today. As we close this series together, would you begin with me in prayer? Thank you so much, God, that you are not only a comforting God, a kind God, You are also a capable God. You are the God who can conquer all things. You are omnipotent. So as we close this series today, I ask you be with these words of mine that they would not just be another sermon, but that they would be food for our souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you probably notice that we are entering another political season in our country. Over the next five months, we will see more and more advertisements on television from both of the two finalist candidates, if you will, the finalists for president, our current president, who will be running again, and the Democratic lead, and that is Joe Biden. I'm going to stay way away from politics of the moment, but I would like to say that as a political science undergraduate major and as someone who studied and worked on Capitol Hill, One of the things I remember that is essential for all great politicians, all great leaders really, is that they have two main components. The first is they must convey a sense of capability, a sense of strength, a sense that they are in charge, that they can figure out tough problems. But the other side is that they must also demonstrate a kind side, a comforting side, a gentle side. And all great politicians, all great leaders have the ability to do both. Just to lift off a couple of historic examples, there was, of course, our own Ronald Reagan from the state of California. Ronald Reagan had this ability to both give a sense of control and command, but also kindness. I can still remember him standing in front of the Christmas White House, the tree with his wife, Nancy, and saying something like, well, Merry Christmas, America. That's my best Ronald Reagan impression. He had commercials that said things like, it's morning in America. But it was also the same person who stood in front of the Berlin Wall and yelled to Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Reagan had both a sense of strength and a sense of comfort. And there have been many other presidents who were able to do this. John F. Kennedy was another example. He had a sense of humor. He had a soft side. Even when he was saying, Ich bin ein Berliner, 
which of course means, hello, jelly roll in Berlin. I am a jelly roll in Berlin. And we have laughed about that ever since. Even John F. Kennedy saw the humor in that. And then, of course, at his inauguration, John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. There was comfort. And yet, on the other side, he was able to stand down another Russian dictator president, Khrushchev. You see, all great leaders have the ability to be both strong and the ability to be comforting. Now, what we often find, though, in society is either things are all gentleness and no strength, or they are all strength and no kindness. A couple of quick examples before we look at our text. I'll never forget a backpacking trip that our family took in Idaho when I was about nine years old. And we'd had a long day of backpacking, and then we are in our tents, and it's the middle of the night, and I hear this sniffing and this grunting and this scratching, and I realize that it is a black bear outside of the tent. I was freaked out at nine, and I would still be freaked out at 48, and didn't know exactly what to do, so I scrambled right in between my parents, and I got inside my sleeping bag, and there was my mom and dad on each side. I guess I thought to myself, if the grizzly bear eats us, I'll just be the middle of the sandwich. I don't know. But looking back on it, you know, that was very comforting and kind to be inside of my wonderful parents' love. And yet, if the bear had attacked, there was really little that they could have done. So that was all gentleness and no strength. On the other side, I had the opportunity once when I was senior pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Colorado Springs to be a part of a decommissioning service for a Black Hawk helicopter secret ops captain. It was such an honor to be a part of this. And again, we give a shout out to our armed forces wherever you are and however you have served. But I will never forget the levels of security that I had to go through just to get into the North American Aerospace Defense Headquarters, otherwise known as NORAD. Now, I can't tell you exactly where it is or how I got in, because if I did, I would have to kill you. But I can tell you that I took about five frisk downs and walking through five different layers of security and an entire background check to just get into this little room where the assistant secretary of defense was and a lot of army and navy brass, and there I was offering a prayer. One might say that NORAD is all fortitude and strength, but it must be said it wasn't very comforting or gentle. So we have a tendency to either have all gentleness or all strength. But the main point I want you to hear today is that we have a God that is both comforting and kind and gentle and calming, and we have a God who is strong. That is Jesus. Jesus is omnipotent. He is all capable, and he is comforting and kind. And that leads us into our final text of this series. We're looking again at a storm story. Now, Jesus and the disciples have been hard at work all day long, where they have been turning a little boy's lunch into a feast for 5,000 people. They're all exhausted. And so Jesus sends the disciples quickly home and decides to spend the rest of the time by himself in prayer. So that's where we pick up our text. Let's listen for God's word. We're looking at the gospel of Mark. You are welcome to follow along on the screen, or you're also welcome to pick up one of your own Bibles and read for yourself. I'm reading from the New International Version. This is Mark 6, 45 through 51. This is how it begins. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. Now, if you look at a map of the northern part of the Lake of Galilee, you can see that Bethsaida is where that red bubble is. And the feeding of the 5,000 takes place in or around Capernaum. And as you can see, it's maybe only five or six miles to get from Capernaum to Bethsaida. So Jesus was literally sending the disciples around the corner to just quickly go home. But we find out as he then goes up to the mountain to pray by himself, later that night, the boat was in the middle 
wait, the boat was in the middle of the lake? How did the disciples get from the northern shore to the middle of the lake? All they had to do was quick six miles to get home. What I think we can infer from this is that they're in trouble, which leads us to one of my main points today, and that is that you don't have to be in the middle of nowhere to find yourself in trouble. You might just be in your own neighborhood and find yourself in trouble. The wind has literally blown these disciples in their little boat all the way to the middle of the lake, 20 and 30, 40, perhaps miles away. So there they are, rowing against the wind. They're perhaps even freaking out as they're in the middle of the boat. Now, Jesus is up on the side of the mountain, and he sees the disciples down there straining at the oars because the wind was against them. The next line is shortly before dawn. Wait a minute. Jesus has allowed the disciples to row against the wind all night long. We might ask ourselves, why didn't Jesus quickly get into the lake and help the disciples? We don't know exactly. But one of the truths of our faith is that just because Jesus is not immediately present in the middle of our life, in the middle of our struggles, does not mean that Jesus is not observing from afar. I often wonder to myself, where is Christ in the middle of whatever problem I'm having? And then I remember, maybe God is trying to help me to learn and grow in this moment. So he has watched them when he wasn't praying all night long. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake, walking on the water. If you were to talk to a person who doesn't know much about Christianity, this text would probably be one of the iconic images of our Lord. Of course, Jesus is born in a manger. Most people know that image, and people know that he went to the cross, but he also walks on water out to the disciples. The next line is, he was about to pass them by, which again is a peculiar line. Why is he not rushing to their aid? Maybe he's hoping they figure it out for themselves. Maybe he knows that they're not in that much trouble and he is going to help them to grow. We don't know. But it says that when they saw him walk on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. Now, again, this is also a peculiar line. If these were city slickers from Jerusalem, one might be able to understand why they might think that this was a ghost. However, These are seasoned fishermen who have been on that lake since they were kids. They know that there are no ghosts on that lake. And yet this leads us to another point, and this may relate for where you are today. When you are lost or you are in trouble, and sometimes when you are in the middle of the storm, it is very easy to lose grip on basic things. We all need to give each other permission and space to be able to deal with what we're dealing with. So there Jesus is is spoken to by the disciples. They see him, they cry out, they think it's a ghost. And then the text says, immediately he spoke to them, notice a kind, calm voice. And here is where the God who walks on water does something that is not only powerful, he is comforting. He says in a calm, kind voice, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. I hope you hear those words sometime this week as you are in the midst of whatever you are dealing with. Take, take courage, do not be afraid, I am your God. This is a formulation of our eight-word sentence, do not be afraid, I am your God. In Hebrew, which we learned a couple of weeks ago, and Jesus, of course, speaks Aramaic, which is a form of Hebrew, Jesus says to the disciples, Hazak, and then it is I, this is a I am statement, this is a proclamation of who God is. He's saying, Hazak, Yahweh, Hazak, Yahweh. And so he says, do not be afraid. Now, here's the central text of what I want to try to communicate today. Here, Jesus could have stayed outside of the boat. 
He could have calmed them down from afar, but no, he goes inside of the boat. He climbs into the boat with them. And at that moment, the wind died down. Isn't that a beautiful coming together of these two themes of strength over the sea, over, over the lake, and comfort at the same time? That is an essential quality of who Jesus is. And you can see this throughout his entire ministry. When Jesus is showing strength at the end of his life as he is on the cross about seven hours, he looks down and he sees his mother and he asks the beloved disciple, would you take care of my mother? You see this strength and kindness throughout the entire New Testament. And we don't mean to beat up on other faith systems, but we do perhaps need to say that this is a distinguishing feature of Christianity. See, our God is not just a distant, powerful God, but our God is a comforting and close one as well. But what will we do with this today as we are entering about the 10th, 11th week of sheltering in place? Well, I feel like we as a society, we as a church need these two things now more than ever. We need comfort and we need strength. I've been trying to think what this shelter-in-place experience has been like, if it's been like anything else. And I must say, there is nothing in my life that has ever resembled this. And I've spoken to many of you who have lived longer than I and said nothing has ever been like this, that this is the weirdest time we have ever had. Amen. But if I was to compare it to something I've experienced, it might be a little like, like an international flight. Have you ever taken a really, really, really long international flight, like to the Philippines or to Japan or perhaps China, a direct flight, 17 hours in the air? That's what it feels like. We're sort of in this cramped little space with the people that we love. We don't have much leg room. In my case, we have a table which sometimes opens and sometimes doesn't. But as soon as this shelter in place began, one of the ways we tried to deal with this as a family is to just give the kids lots of little snacks throughout the day. And guess what? That's also what they do on airline flights. You know, you you take off from San Francisco International Airport and five minutes in, the pilot's saying, well, we have a cruising altitude of about 35,000 feet and we hope you enjoy the ride. And then the flight attendant says, I'm coming around with a a beverage of your choice. And you think, well, wonderful. I could use a glass of Coke or whatever at this point. And she gives you a nice little bag of pretzels. And 30 minutes later, the flight attendant is coming around with another beverage of of my choice and another round of pretzels and a really terrible sandwich wrap. And I haven't even finished my first bag of pretzels and I've got half of my Coke still on my tray table. And it's meal after meal after meal after meal after meal because they know that one of the ways to keep people occupied is to continue to feed them. And the other thing they know is they offer many online entertainment options. They show you films. And today you can have a selection of like a thousand films from any category or genre. Now, after the first film, I think that was fun. I might even have another beverage of my choice. But then by the second and the third and the fourth film, I can't even remember what happened in the first film. And the flight goes on and on and on. And then the pilot comes on and says, we hope you're doing well. We're going to turn off our cabin lights, and we only have another five and a half hours to go. That's what it feels like to watch television these days. And nobody knows how long this thing's going to go. All we have are our little snacks and our online flight entertainment options. But you know what I need and I bet you need? We need comfort. I bet you are not afraid in your shelter in place. Some of you might be, but I bet most of you are not afraid, but you do need comfort. You do need a sense that the Lord is in that space with you. And that is Jesus' promise, to be in your boat. But that's not the only thing we need, because to have a comforting God is not enough. We need a strong God. Because frankly, we do not know who is in charge out there. 
doesn't matter which political party you are from, doesn't matter which, which ideologies you embrace, nobody has any confidence that those people out there know all of what they're supposed to be doing. Amen? But we do have one person who knows what he's doing and who is in charge and who is strong and who is capable and who is working against this terrible virus. And that is our Lord, Jesus Christ. You can take it to the bank. Jesus and many doctors and scientists and virologists are working on this, but our Lord is present, a strength out there to try to stop this terrible plague. And the reason I know that is because he's done it before. The year was 1634. It was a little tiny German town by the name of Oper Amagal. And I know that many of you who are watching this were hoping to go to Oper Amagal and can't. But you also know that 380 years ago, there was another plague that was besetting our world, and it was the bubonic plague. And through that terrible plague, 50 to 90 million people died. Over 60% of Europe's population was annihilated. Except this little town was pretty safe. Until one Christmas, there was a visitor who came from afar to visit Oper Amagau, and he had the plague. Soon thereafter, the entire town was infected with this virus. The city council got together, and they, like us, did not know exactly what to do. And they didn't know anything about social distancing. They didn't know anything about masks. They didn't know anything about germs, but they did know something about the Lord. And they decided as a city council at that time that they would dedicate themselves to the Lord, that they would begin a whole course of prayer as a town, continuing to pray for everyone in their town. Then they decided to do a strange thing, and that is to have a passion play. I don't know if you've ever been to a passion play before, but these are vignettes of people who are standing like this man is in the early 1900s. He is standing in place perfect stillness. They did scene after scene after scene from the Bible. Incredible thing happened. Not one person in that little village of Oprah Amagau, except for the main carrier of the disease, died. All of them were cured. Now, if you were to talk to a scientist today, I'm sure they might say, well, it's, it's a coincidence that no one died. And maybe it is. But I believe it was the Lord, the Lord who is the Lord of all strong things, who is in charge, the Lord who is also a comforting Lord, who comes to us in our spaces, in our boats, the Lord who walked upon the water to meet us where we are. Thank you, God, so much for not just being comforting and kind, but also strong. And because of that, we do not need to be afraid. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever seen the wonder In the glimmer of her sight As the eyes begin to open And the blindness means the light If you have so say I see the world in light I see the world in wonder I see the world in light Bursting in the living color I see the world your way And I'm walking in the light Have you ever seen the world?
We are glad that you have been here today. There are never enough words of thanksgiving for your being part of our worshiping community. One of the ways that I keep faith with God in my life is by observing the centuries long tradition of the church year. It is my anchor and it is my road. This Sunday marks the end of the Easter season and it is the very reason we are known as Easter people. During this season, the disciples' fears are calmed as they encounter Jesus in various locations. They are given a sense of hope as they assemble in a sequestered location. Does that sound familiar? They are waiting the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to send an advocate, a comforter, the Holy Spirit. As we end no fear, God near, let us look towards the idea of no fear, the Holy Spirit is here. I feel that God is leading us and holding us close. As we prepare ourselves for the season of Pentecost, we invite you to wear red next Sunday, even if not in our church building. It can be in a various ways on a theme. For instance, red socks, a red shirt or blouse, or even red pajamas. Be part of our service next week by preparing yourselves to receive the Holy Spirit. Open yourselves to God's love, compassion, and God's word. We know Jesus calms the restless seas and is present in our lives. We look to the Holy Spirit to calm our inner turbulence, to indwell in us a sense of calm in the face of human chaos and confusion. Hear this old gospel hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace.